Okay, so we knew about the figurehead king. Does Britain now have a figurehead prime minister? Liz Truss's grip on power slipping by the day. A U-turn on unfunded tax cuts for the rich most likely won't be enough to repair the damage. Is she really reduced to the role of prime minister only in name? In name only? And is she really the problem or the symptom of the problem? It's now four UK prime ministers and counting in the six years since Brexit. What brought on such a turmoil in a democracy once admired for its stability? Today, with inflation and energy crisis and the post-pandemic strain on the welfare state, there's nowhere to hide for those who lay claim to the high halls of power. Beyond calls for snap elections, does Britain's parliamentary democracy find itself at a turning point? And if so, which way next? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Liz Truss and the UK's political instability. Joining us from London, Jill Rudder, senior fellow at the Institute for Government Think Tank. Welcome back to the show. Good evening. Uh, from Bratislava, Slovakia, former British member of the European Parliament, uh, Charles Tanek, thanks for joining us. Good evening. From the French Provence town of Grasse, journalist Peter Gumbel, the author of Citizens of Everywhere, Searching for Identity in the Age of Brexit. Uh, good to see you, Peter. Thank you, Francois. Nicolas uh, Jara Joly is a member of the Labour Party and uh, uh, a graduate student here in Paris. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. hashtag F24debate. She's still the prime minister, or so they said, entering the cabinet meeting this morning. How long can the prime minister last? Has she got your support? Does she have your support? Does she have the cabinet support? That was Home Secretary Suella Braverman, who you hear there, considered one of the uh, one of a long list of dark horse candidates should trust decide uh, to step down. The PM, though, after apologizing for going, quote, too far too fast with her mini budget, insisting in an interview to the BBC that she's not going away. I'm sticking around because I was elected to deliver for this country, and that is what I am determined to do. And will you lead the Conservatives into the next general election? I will lead the Conservatives into the next general election. Definitely. Well, look, yeah. I'm not focused on internal debates within the Conservative Party. But you need to be, don't you? I am know, you know you need to be in order to stay in office. The important thing is that I've been elected to this position to deliver for the country. Jill Rudder, your reaction when you hear Liz Truss talking about saying, I've been elected uh, to this position to deliver for the country? Well, she was elected by, in the way in which we elect Conservative Party leaders. Uh, she came, didn't come first among the members of parliament. She did get into the final two, but then got quite a decent majority when it went to that electorate of uh, Conservative Party members. Not a huge electorate in any case. So she ended up being elected by, I think, around 80,000 Conservative members. It has to be said that one of the consequences of Liz Truss's election, and indeed a consequence of Jeremy Corbyn's election earlier as Labour Party leader, is some thinking again about whether the idea of letting party members as opposed to MPs vote, particularly when the person in charge is going to be prime minister, really makes sense because it does mean that we, uh, both parties, end up with leaders who don't necessarily command the support of all their members of parliament, don't command a majority there. And w which system's fairer? Which one is more democratic? Depends on your interpretation of democracy. You could argue if people go to the effort of becoming party members, that you know it's only right to give them a say in who leads the party. But you could equally say that people who are party members don't tend necessarily to be that representative of people who've actually voted for the party. Quite a lot of evidence that we have uh, we have seen that the views of Conservative Party members are to the right of people who vote Conservative and indeed to the right of people who are MPs for the Conservative Party. And you could say the same on the Labour Party, that people who 
actually are engaged enough to become party members. The overwhelming majority of people don't join political parties, which may be a very sad state of affairs, but unfortunately true, is that they, you know, the Labour Party membership isn't necessarily particularly representative of Labour Party membership, and that's how you end up with somebody like Jeremy Corbyn as the pick of the members, even though he'd been repeatedly rejected by uh, the MPs that he was supposed to be leading. And that leads to real discipline problems within the parliamentary party when you don't have a leader who commands the respect and support of their MPs. And that that's before Liz Truss then went and made this uh, very, very difficult and wrong political judgment about the mini-budget on the 23rd of September. Well, this very difficult and, 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 and wrong uh, judgment. Uh, Peter Gumbel, uh, the assessment is that she clearly was not the right person for the job, and yet she got picked. I think you have to stand back and, and look at this in a broader context. I think anybody in that position would be struggling right now because what we're seeing know, is the I've lost the picture. I've lost my picture for some reason. Oh, okay. We're, we're seeing the unraveling of uh, uh, essentially you know, years of, uh, of of abuse and uh, seeing the unraveling of of a. The collapse of a house of cards. Essentially, that's what's uh, that's what's happening in the in the UK right now. Um, so, would anybody be able to do a better job than Liz Trust, perhaps? Um, but she is very much at the tail end of a, a long and very sad series of very bad political judgments that have been uh, uh, essentially year after year in the UK um, have have dominated the political scene. It's a spectacular crash, though, fueling speculation that the prime minister had started to fade away, and I'm just talking about this week, was markets rebounding and uh, a Liz Truss, who was first a no-show on Monday uh, for a question in Parliament by the opposition. The is detained on urgent business. That uh, inspired mirth from the opposition benches. Uh, social media was wondering, had she opted for a sympathy tour of Ukraine? But no. A little bit later on, when it was no longer her turn to speak, uh, Liz Truss uh, did, did come back to Westminster. It turns out she'd been meeting with the powerful head of her party's parliamentary 1922 Rules Committee, uh, Graham Brady. Uh, Peter Gumbel, uh, the image of her sitting in parliament there but never speaking, what was your reaction? Well, actually... Um it was twofold. On the one hand, it's uh, it's not good to, uh, if you had a, a good British upbringing, to revel in the misfortunes of others. Um, but seeing her like that uh, really made me think, gosh, uh, what has this country come to? Um, and at the same time, there's a real sadness that what we're seeing is uh, the breakdown of, uh, of, of a great system of parliamentary democracy. And essentially, we're entering a period where the British public is going to be paying a very heavy price for years of complete folly. I think the, the the kind of the bigger context is that every so often the country goes off on a kind of a crazy spasm and does things that are uh, against its best interests. And what we're seeing playing out here is the end of that. We're on page 977 of the decline and fall of, of the great uh, British Republic, unfortunately. Um, and so I think uh, watching her like that, um, it was very symbolic, very emblematic of the state of the country. Charles Tannock, uh, you've left the Conservative Party. Is this the breakdown of the Tories? Or as you just heard Peter Gumbel stated, the breakdown of Britain's parliamentary democracy as we know it? Well, I do think that this is a very sad period um, of British governance or the lack of governance. I think that Brexit is the underlying uh, malaise which has infected the Conservative Party, has driven people like me out of the party, marginalised people like me who would not embrace the lies uh, that Brexit brought into our body politic. Uh, I think that Liz Truss clearly is still technically Prime Minister, whether she's still in power. Uh, is debatable, and for how long can she remain Prime Minister is also a big question. 
Um, and she does appear out of her depth, um, frankly, uh, in the highest office of state. Um, and I'm obviously deeply depressed by Britain's reputation being trashed internationally, the pound being hit badly. The, there was a run on the gilt market as a result of the budget or mini budget that was her policy via quasi Kwarteng on the 23rd of September, which clearly wasn't thought through properly and spooked the markets, and rightly so, because it was 60 billion of unfunded. Uh, tax cuts, primarily helping the, the super rich. And I think that uh, we have to look at the fact that the Conservative Party has now become a party of Brexiteers and those who wish to help the super rich. And uh, Boris Johnson was elected on a platform of levelling up and helping the Red Wall in the North, the people who are less privileged, uh, as part of the great Brexit dividend that was promised from Global Britain. Uh, I always knew this was going to be a myth, and clearly, um, you know, quasi Kwarteng, very unwisely, in my view, went off uh, for dinner with a bunch of uh, hedge fund managers, uh, you know, the day before the budget. So um, the whole thing is not good. Um, personally, I would like to see a general election, but the current polling suggests it would be a massacre, it would be a meltdown for the Conservative Party, maybe with only 100 seats and a landslide victory to Labour. Uh, but we shall see what happens next. I mean, people are talking about bringing back Boris Johnson, which I think is absolutely ludicrous. You, you talk about uh, the, the the tax cut for the rich there. Uh, they, the Financial Times quoting uh, one senior Tory member as saying uh, that basically it was a break they hadn't asked for. But in the same way, David Cameron, who was a Remainer, his decision to stage this uh, Brexit referendum, which the British public had not really asked for either. What's, what is it with, with, with these decisions? Well, prime ministers are very powerful individuals. Uh, that's the nature of our constitution. And uh, David Cameron, you know, unfortunately, it was a bit hubristic, thought that it would be an easy win to have a referendum and that Remain would win. And he made it actually quite difficult for Remain uh, to win in but terms why, of the But why the misjudgment? Franchise. Why the misjudgment, Charles? Is, it, is he too much in a bubble? What's that about? Well, I think a lot of politicians live in a kind of Westminster echo chamber. And, uh, you know, Cameron was advised by people around him that the opinion polls suggested that the economy would be the primary concern uh, and that he could win it easily. He'd also, don't forget, won the previous referendum, both in Scotland, to keep the United Kingdom together, and also the one that's less talked about, the AV on, on electoral reform. So he was a little bit hubristic. He'd also won the general election unexpectedly. So I think he was riding on, a, on, on the crest of a wave. But like all hubris, uh, you know, sooner or later you hit your nemesis, and he miscalculated. And we have Brexit. I was one of the few Conservatives from the very beginning, as I knew some mm. of the pro protagonists involved in the, Leave, in, the, in the Leave campaign. I never embraced the lies or the false promises, because I knew they were all speculative. Uh, and frankly, they all, all these people knew that it, the end justified the means, that they could say whatever they liked with impunity, because once you are out, you are out, and it's very hard to reverse unlike a general election. So I left the Conservative Party partly in protest to that, partly to the management of the pandemic, partly to the malfeasance, I thought, during the contracts which were handed out during the uh, COVID pandemic. For many reasons, I many, decided I'd have many, enough. Many reasons. Before I turn to you, uh, Nicholas Jarger, I just want to turn back to Peter Gumbel for one second, because this has been your remit, uh, Peter, writing uh, books about uh, the elites and, and more specifically how they are uh, groomed. Here in France, you've uh, uh, taken a look at the grandes écoles, the institutions of higher learning. All these prime ministers, uh, you have to go back to Gordon Brown to find a British prime minister who did not go to Oxford. Uh, all these prime ministers went to Oxford University. Are they out of touch because of the way they were schooled? I don't think you can go quite as far as that. I think, uh, you know, they're very well-educated people. Um, often it was at, at the school, actually, you know, the Boris uh, and, and others who went to Eton who uh, uh, 
I think they probably grew up with a sense of entitlement from there. Uh, and certainly in Oxford and Cambridge, you you come out of there, you know, thinking you're, you know, you're very smart because you are probably very smart to have gone there. I think um, the bigger issue here, though, is uh, who uh, are they advising? Who's advising them? Who are they talking to? Um, your question, are they in touch, uh, is always a question for elites. Um, but here there's a there's there's a deeper issue, frankly. I think that in Britain, if you look over the last 50 years, there's been an unease about Europe, about Britain and Europe, uh, a sense of, well, you know, we are part of Europe in Britain, but we're not really part of Europe. They're sort of different. They're across the channel. Um, and those tensions have played out very strongly within the Conservative Party in particular. Um, and so that has helped to you know, essentially create this idea that if you take a very pro-British, anti-European stance, there's a way of becoming popular and getting elected. I think what they're doing is they're mistaking internal Conservative Party misgivings about Europe with, with a broader sense in the, in, in the kind of the population at large. I think the other issue, which is really important, which is also uh, very deep, is this sense of British identity. Uh, you know, what is Britain? I mean, we've just had the death of the Queen, and, and it was really interesting to watch all that pomp and circumstance around there. And you get a sense, if, you're, if you weren't British, to, to have seen that, to see there is this sort of idea of tradition, uh, the Commonwealth, the Crown. Uh, it's almost often a different world. So, so that idea of a national identity, uh, almost a nostalgia for a, a glorious golden age that never perhaps existed, plus this misgiving, this feeling with, uh, with Europe, all that comes together. Um, and, and if you are in the Conservative Party and you're smart and you're trying to create a new path for yourself that is going to be different, then you come across this idea of, OK, let's campaign against Europe. That's our that's our platform. And unfortunately, that is that was the the, the sort of the overwhelming sense of, of behind Brexit and got us into you know all this mess uh, in the first place because it was a completely boneheaded decision to to focus on leaving Europe as as somehow a a, a legitimate political platform. Nicholas Jarajoli, your, your your thoughts on this because we've seen uh, over the over again this turnover of prime ministers now uh, over the last. Uh, uh, six years since mm. since that Brexit uh, referendum, <clears throat> and we were in London mm. uh, f after the Queen died to for, to cover it. And what we found was the British. It was a moment of reflection for them, and they were proud of their unwritten constitution and their 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 parliamentary system. Even the ones who were Republican. Mm. Um. I, I don't necessarily think it's a crisis of the parliamentary system. Uh, we're often, what's interesting about what's going on right now is that we're often told one of the sources of stability in the British system is that if you have a parliamentary majority, you can, you can do more or less what you want. Um, and that is supposedly a source of stability. There are no impasses in parliament. And now what we're seeing is a crisis with a huge parliamentary majority. Uh, which, which is historically not, not very common. Since the Brexit referendum, I mean, I think, I think the crisis that we're talking about is more of a crisis inside the Tory party, which maybe has lots of facets. Um, you heard Jill Rudder say that it's a crisis in both parties and that uh, when it came to Labour, uh, Jeremy Corbyn won thanks to an energised base, mm -hmm. but he didn't appeal to a broader public. Uh, that's that's perhaps true. Uh, the results of the 2017 election might uh, muddy the waters in terms of that particular uh, view. Um, but I, th I think what's going on right now is a crisis in the Tory party, particularly of their own economic doctrine. Um, Boris Johnson won in 2019 a resounding victory with a mandate for inverted commas levelling up and so on and so on, uh, a sort of redistributive mandate. Uh, he's gone now and the Tories have reverted back to form. There's a, uh, some form of uh, austerity politics re-emerging and there is, of course, no mandate for that. And so there's a crisis in the Tory party with, which has a sort of a lack of project and, um, you know, to, to join uh, the, the other guest in, in, what, in what she said, um, I think that to say that 
to compare the kind of lack of support that uh, the last leader of the Labour Party had in the in the parliamentary Labour Party and the lack of support that Truss has is it slightly misleading because although Truss, of course, did lose uh, in terms of parliamentary nominations in the Tory party, she still gained a decent amount, a lot more than Jeremy Corbyn did. Um, and so to say that it's a problem of confidence of the Conservative Parliamentary Party in uh, Liz Truss, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced. I think that there's a, a wider crisis going on in the Tory party, which has a lack of project and which has uh, lost sight of its mandate. And because, although, of course, you know, uh, constitutionally, it's perfectly uh, legitimate to be electing a new prime minister on the basis of the selectorate that is the Tory party membership. In the eyes of the public, it can appear more and less and less legitimate and less and less reasonable thing to do. And so on that level, there is perhaps some sort of a crisis of the system itself, uh, you could say. Uh, there's lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Uh, Francisco on Twitter uh, stating that uh, perhaps uh, uh, it's the end of the system that only has uh, two big uh, parties. Jill Rudder, your thoughts on that? I think that's very interesting because I think one of the things we have seen is that actually, you know, as Nicholas was saying, the advantage of our electoral system is supposed to be that you get these strong and stable majority governments. <coughs> but we've seen the Conservatives really descend into a degree of fragmentation and factionism that means even with a big majority, prime ministers can't be guaranteed to get their way. And we've also seen, you know, with actions of Boris Johnson, removing the whip, so expelling from the party people who voted against him, even though quite a lot of the people he had in his cabinet were serial rebels who'd voted huge numbers of times against Theresa May's government. We've really seen a big ideological shift within the Conservative Party. And I do think there are a lot of people now who feel quite electorally homeless. And I think it may be the time to ask whether we wouldn't be better served by an electoral system that allowed people, you know, not just to vote for whatever conservative the local party puts up, but to choose between people maybe from more sort of Christian democratic, centrist, centre-right tradition, or maybe more from a nearer to the UK independence party, further right position. You know, in, in a sense, the sort of party that uh, Liz Truss uh, is representing with, because one of the things that's very interesting about her agenda as exemplified by her mini budget is how different it was, the sort of points that were being made, how different it was from the manifesto in which Boris Johnson was elected and got that big majority in 2019. Uh, it, was, it was extremely different. Why did she do that? Again, I asked that question. I think this is what she's believed. I mean, one of the things that was known about Liz Truss was that she was one of the authors of a pamphlet back in 2011, 2012, called Britannia Unchained, which did, you know, trace the roots of a lot of problems of Britain to a low-growth economy, over-regulated, too high tax, too big a state. That's the wing of the party she came from. I think one of the really big problems she and Kwasi Kwarteng had on the 23rd of September, which is having just announced this very, very big energy support package a uh, day or two before, they went big on the tax cutting side, but actually didn't convince anyone that they really had plans that added up to much, either to shrink the size of the state dramatically at the moment, most of the pressures on public spending, I think a bit like in France, are for more public spending to help people with the cost of living, to repair public services damaged during the pandemic, uh, nor indeed to plausibly boost the growth rate. One of the big issues in the UK has been that we all think we need planning reform to try and make it easier to build houses, to boost the economy. But it's incredibly difficult to get that through Parliament. And I don't think Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng convinced anyone that they actually really had a convincing growth plan, nor that they really, really had it in them and could bring the parliamentary party with them to cut public spending, as, a re as would have been required to make their numbers add up once they'd gone, gone that big on tax cuts. Charles Tannock, at the beginning of the conversation, uh, we showed... Uh those scenes Monday in Parliament where first Liz Truss wasn't there and then when she was, she didn't speak. 
Is Jeremy Hunt the de facto prime minister of England right now? Well, clearly, he, it was actually quite an enlightened move for Liz Truss to bring him on board because mm -hmm. he is seen as a safe pair of hands, a stabilizing influence, and the markets have recovered. And, of course, he's reversed most, most of the tax cuts uh, and is now talking about spending cuts. So we're back to a more sound management of the economy uh, under his stewardship as Chancellor of the Exchequer, no doubt about it. He's also positioned himself, of course, to be the obvious successor uh, to um, Liz Truss uh, if she were to resign alongside Boris, who, those who want to bring Boris back. It would appear to me they're the two favourites at the moment amongst the backbenchers. But going back to what you were saying earlier, I do think that we do need to have uh, proportional representation in Britain. I think that the two-party first-past-the-post system has now found to be very wanting, mm. uh, in, you know, given the divisions that there are uh, generated largely <clears throat> by, by Brexit. So, I'm, I mean, people like me, you know, disaffected former Tories, we're all hoping that there could be something new emerge from either a very bad defeat of the general election or the Labour government agreeing to something along the PR lines eventually. Because I do think that we are seeing the end of the two-party system. There are big fault lines now mm -hmm. in our constitutional arrangements. And I don't see how we can carry on as we have done in the past. Because uh, once you have a system whereby people don't obey the conventions at the top and are prepared to lie to the Queen and challenge all sorts of things, if you have a a strong majority. You can, as somebody said earlier, do more or less what you want. And I think we, a lot of the public and people like myself, want more checks and balances in the system. And uh, and I think PR is obviously the way ahead. But I do, going back mm. to what you were saying about Liz Truss, uh, clearly we have to see whether she makes a, an appearance at part, uh, Prime Minister's Questions time, uh, you know, whether she can hold her weight. This is very critical for her. If in the next week or so it's not clear that she is running the country as prime minister, then all bets are off. Yeah, we'll see those Wednesday qu Parliament's question time. Uh, Nicholas Jarjordi, very briefly mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. that point, proportional representation is a way of more... Uh, a government that better represents the people? Your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think so. I think... Um First it's an old chestnut here in France, you know, we, yeah. and it keeps getting promised and never gets enacted. Well, the system in France is a lot closer to PR than the one we have in Britain. Uh, of course, there are presidential elections mm. in France. But you bigger. think that the proportional representation would be better? I think it would be better. Um, yeah, on the whole, I think it would be better, certainly. I don't see it happening simply because I don't see it being in the interest of either of the two dominant parties uh, to do it, and you would need a parliamentary majority under first past the post to enact PR. So um, it, it, I think it's far off, and the kind of pressure that would need to come from below uh, to kind of p push it forward, I don't see it yet. All right. The, 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 as was said by our panelists, Liz Trust badly misreading uh, both uh, the mood domestically and the markets uh, to keep a lid on the deficit. There will be pain, warns the new chancellor. Uh, decisions of eye-watering difficulty, headlines the Daily Telegraph this Tuesday. The new chancellor telling the Commons of a slim down of that energy subsidy uh, that the PM had promised. That's going to hit consumers and businesses. Pubs will struggle in the run-up to the World Cup, particularly if uh, they're on top of it there's a transport strike. Britain's trade union's Congress kicked off its, Congress, uh, its conference in Brighton with a call for the Prime Minister to resign. It's General Secretary Francis O'Grady telling the Financial Times that inflation flirting with uh, uh, double digits uh, means UK workers face 20 years of uh, uh, lost uh, wages. Uh, and, you know, I'll put it to you first, Nicholas. This, uh, this issue of inflation, it's the same one we have here, and we had a national strike day here today. Well, so, yeah, I mean, I think that <clears throat> probably there's lots of different dimensions to the crisis going on. Is it the same or is it different? The same here as in Britain? Uh, no, it's worse in Britain uh, because there's a less of a social safety net. Um, various things are still in place that are not in place in Britain. Um, some of the kind of uh, policies to safeguard from it that have been uh, enacted in France have not been enacted in Britain. So the situation is worse in Britain. And I think the, the cost of living crisis and this attendant uh, 
revival of the British workers' movement, I guess, that we're seeing in, 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 in these, these strike movements um, is, a, is a big part of the crisis as well, which is not going to go away whether you change leader or, or whether trust stays in or not. That's going to continue. In, indeed, whether Labour win the next election, uh, you know, that's not necessarily going to change these things. And it's probably a crisis that whoever's going to be in government over the next few years is going to have to deal with in one way or another. Uh, obviously, I think Labour would do so better. Uh, but, uh, but I think that this is an important part of the crisis which can't, can't be ignored and can't really be separated from, from the kind of the spectacle that we're seeing <laughs> in P Westminster. Peter Gumbel, listening to Nicholas talk about the uh, unwinding uh, of the welfare state in Britain. Well, that's brings us squarely to the topic of, of your book, uh, Citizens of Everywhere Searching for Identity in, in the Age of Brexit. It's part essay, part memoir. You tell of your uh, father who fled Nazi Germany uh, and uh, of the grit that uh, re Britain represented first with the war and then with those post-war years uh, are coming undone. I, I, I ask the question, is this a British problem or is this potentially a worldwide problem? Well, certainly the economic situation is worldwide. Uh, there's no doubt about it in France and the rest of Europe. You've got the same issues of uh, you know rising prices, uh, rising interest rates, uh, the problems of funding the welfare state. Um, I think, uh, though, what makes it specifically British um, are, are a couple of factors. The first factor is that the British economy for many years, and for a long time, actually, has been actually pretty resilient and more resilient than many economies in, in, uh, in continental Europe. Um, and what has happened now with Brexit, the City of London has given up, has had to give up, essentially, the its role as the sort of the, the financial capital of Europe. Um, you've got uh, mortgage rates in the UK um, just incredibly high suddenly and a very large percentage, I think something like 20% of British homeowners have variable rate mortgages. So they're going to feel the impact much, much more uh, severely. I think the, the, the other thing that's going on though is, is the longer term question, um, which is what role for Britain um, going forward there's a there's a real identity crisis i think this is what brexit fundamentally represents which is um what is britain today uh, you know liz truss interestingly tried to make it a kind of a low regulation low tax singapore on the thames which is one of the promises of a certain constituency for for brexit um, and that completely failed the markets immediately said no way so that's gone so then the question is well what is Britain, you've now essentially severed your ties with your best trading partners, with your best friends, um, and you don't really have a kind of a plan B. Um, so you're a, a medium-sized power with nuclear weapons off a continent with whom you've been cutting your economic ties. Uh, there's a real identity crisis, I think, and that's what's going on. And it's going to be incredibly interesting to watch how this plays out, because I, my suspicion is the Tories will be wiped out. Um, but the Labour Party also, you know, they were pro-Brexit. They were very divided, but they didn't oppose it. Um, and so there's a, I think there has to be a reckoning now with what happened, how did we get into this, um, and how do we get out of it? What is the future? Um, and if you allow me one more thought, which is that the parliamentary system in the UK with Labour and the Conservatives alternating over you know, generations. Um, interestingly enough, the rest of Europe has moved away from right left. If you look at France, you know, Macron has arrived in the middle um, and right and left, the traditional parties collapsed. If you look at Italy, even at Germany, you've seen alternative parties. So in some ways, the reckoning with Brexit and the change in a parliamentary system could be good. It could be what Britain needs to help refine itself. And I, I strongly hope that that will indeed now happen as part of this recovering process that will probably take some time. Well, Jill, Jill Rudder, uh, is Britain, uh, a, at the end of the day, more like the rest of Europe when it comes to reforming its institutions? Or is it like the United States, where there's the feeling that uh, uh, the rules are cast in stone and it's impossible to get out of that dichotomy of one center-left and one center-right party? 
Uh, it's very interesting to see what will happen. Of course, we we have the sort of significant rise of the Scottish National Party, uh, who can exploit our system extremely well because it's very favourable if you're if you concentrate mm. your vote in one area, you do incredibly well, and that <coughs> obviously creates tensions because about the future of the UK itself. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I was very struck by what Nicola was saying. He didn't think that the time was necessarily right for electoral reform. I do think it's probably back on the agenda because, you know, big question marks in many senses over both major parties and where they've got to and the extent to which they really adequately reflect public opinion. But I think one of the really interesting consequences is a lot of people have thought that it was very difficult for Labour to come back after the massive hammering they took in 2019, that they couldn't possibly win the next election. Then there was some thought that if they did, it would only be as part of a coalition with Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP. The SNP would demand a referendum on Scottish independence, part of their price for supporting Labour. Uh, Labour, of course, saying it wouldn't agree that. And the Liberal Democrats might demand electoral reform. But it's possible that Keir Starmer might find himself in the position Tony Blair found himself in in 1997. I think Tony Blair himself was probably quite pro-electoral reform, but he won such a big majority that it rather put the question uh, out of consideration for his entire tenure in office. And I think if Keir Starmer found himself with anything like the numbers that, uh, that are being shown by current polling, I don't think he could probably convince his party that this was the time to be backing an electoral reform system, which would mean that huge numbers of them would lose their seats. Mm. So, uh, Nicholas, if we understand Jill correctly, mm. it's better news for Britain's democracy if Labour doesn't win by a landslide. <laughs> you, you agree with that? Uh, potent uh, in, in this sense, yes, potentially. Uh, at least, put it this way, PR is more likely if... Uh, Labour has to depend Explain on... Explain what PR is. Uh, PR, sorry, proportional representation. Right. Um, is more likely if the Labour has to depend on votes from the Lib Dems or the SNP uh, when, if it enters government. Uh, yes, I, I, would, I would agree. As for the view from abroad, well, it's even a topic of conversations at ice cream parlours in Portland, Oregon. Britain get the stability? Well, it's predictable. I, mean, it was, I wasn't the only one that thought it was a mistake. And, uh, the, yeah. But look, it, she. Uh, can, Hi, how are you? Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, the idea of cutting taxes on the super wealthy at a time when. Anyway, I just think I, I disagree with the policy, but it's up to Great Britain to make that judgment, not me. Charles Tannock, uh, the U.S. president, uh, true to form, uh, saying perhaps slightly more than his advisors uh, would have liked. Uh, your, your reaction, though, to this, uh, Britain had banked a lot on uh, uh, strengthening the special relationship after Brexit. I think what was said earlier is perfectly true. Most people that I knew in the Conservative Party who are Brexiteers, they had this nostalgia for the English-speaking world, the Anglosphere, the Commonwealth and the United States together, and that they could jettison Europe and erect trade barriers with Europe, but replace them with free trade agreements with the Commonwealth countries and the United States. So, of course, they all banked on a Trump uh, second term. And Joe Biden uh, coming to the White House has obviously put a spanner in the works. And Joe Biden being of Irish heritage is a big problem, given what the government is doing over the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, but as far as uh, President Biden making those comments are concerned, he was attacked uh, in the British media, I think unfairly. He made it perfectly clear it was ultimately a British decision. Uh, but also, I, am sick, I, was, I was sick to death of the British media uh, criticizing the Eurozone, the economies of, of European countries, uh, and, and, and sustaining the Euro, and the Euro would all collapse, and the whole project was part of the rotting corpse of the, of the Eurozone from which we had to decouple. So I'm afraid I won't have any lessons from Brexiteers or Conservatives in government about um, the right for the American president to comment 
on 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 the British budget. Uh, he made it perfectly clear that it wasn't it wasn't a good idea. And ultimately, the whole world is affected because at the end of the day, if uh, the the British economy were to go into a tailspin and there was a um, and there was some kind of uh, run on the on the pound and on the gilt market, then clearly it would be a major a major problem. Uh, for uh, a global economy, not just the British economy, as a lot of banks across the world hold uh, British treasuries. So I have no problem with that. Uh, I'm grateful that Joe Biden is in office. I think Trump's second term would have been a huge problem uh, for, um, the, for the UK and for global security, mm. particularly now with the war in Ukraine. And so uh, the Anglosphere has always been a myth. There is no such thing as an Anglosphere, as an economic and political trading bloc. And that was one of the lies that was put about by, by the Brexit campaign, I'm afraid. Peter Gumbel, in your book, you uh, describe your decision to apply for German citizenship. Uh, that was written before the war in Ukraine and before Liz Truss became prime minister. Your, have your views evolved? Uh, no, no, not at all. I, I was, um, you know, I, I was motivated by uh, by Brexit. Obviously, it was a, it was partly pragmatic. It was partly about being able to carry on living and working in France without any bureaucratic hassles. But it was also um, a sense of, you know, who am I, and and, and the idea that Brexit made me choose. Uh, I wasn't able to be both British and European at the same time. It was very difficult, um, and so I acquired another passport to enable me to do that. So my views haven't changed. I think um, I think the sadness has, though. I think uh, I, I look at what's happening in the UK, and I, I'm 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 sad. I'm worried, and I'm sad because I think uh, uh, there is uh, a decline taking place. It's not the sort of the project fear. Uh, it's all going to collapse in a heap the moment uh, you vote. It's more of a a long term, uh, like a cancer eating away at British society, um, and. That is very saddening, frankly. Is that how you see it, Nicholas Jarjoli? Do I see what Brexit is? A decline? Is a... The UK in a decline right now? Is the UK in a decline? Yes, yes, potentially. Uh, I Brexit is uh, maybe only just a part of it. Um, I, I'm not sure... I'm not sure if I would so readily put it all on the back as, as, uh, of Brexit. Um... <laughs> But but certainly, I think there's a decline happening, and uh, I don't know. There's a, a, a very apposite word in French, uh, une dégringolade. You know, there's a, a things free coming fall. apart at the seams, as it were. Mm. Uh, certainly, yeah. Uh, Jill Rudder, uh, is there any chance that uh, the, the the relationship with the EU will be revisited? Um, I think it's really interesting. There are some, uh, do appear to be some big shifts in public opinion about Brexit. There's a poll out today that was commissioned by a think tank that Tony Blair founded uh, after he left office, um, which shows that the majority of people would like a closer relationship with the EU, and if it reduced the price of imports, would be prepared to accept much more alignment with EU regulations. So that might be quite interesting reading, not least for the Labour Party, uh, who've now finally, finally come out with a policy of trying to make Brexit work. So we assume that they'd like to deepen the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU and sort out the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think although Liz Truss's time in office has been completely sort of dominated by her economic faux pas, I think what is quite interesting is that she did seem to be resetting relationships with Europe a bit. She went to the first meeting of the European mm. political community. It wasn't at all clear until just before that that she would actually go to that meeting in Prague. Right. She did seem to have some very useful bilaterals there. So perhaps, she perhaps to the start of come something. Out with a much friendlier relationship with President Macron than she went in. So maybe relationships are thawing a bit. Maybe. And they spoke again on the phone this uh, this Tuesday. Uh, Jill Rudder, I want to thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. For, thank you so much for joining us from London. I want to thank uh, as well Charles Tannock for being with us uh, from uh, Bratislava. Uh, Peter Gumbel in uh, Grasse, Nicolas uh, Jarajoli. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.